All right, welcome everyone to chapter four. This is techniques of differentiation with some applications. Section one, we're going to be taking some derivatives of power sums and constant multiples, which we'll see what that is here in just a second. Uh, and so the story continues right from 3.6. We saw that calculating out derivative functions can be a real pain. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, but luckily, there are some shortcut rules, and that's what a lot of this chapter 4 is going to be about, at least the first part of it anyway. Uh, and we're going to be able to calculate out derivatives very, very quickly. But I wanted to remark, right, that we have a warning here. If a problem includes phrasing, such as use the limit definition of the derivative to calculate out the derivative of blah, 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 you must use the definition. You cannot use these tips and tricks we're about to go through. So. Let's go ahead and practice this one last time before we get to those tricks. Example 1.2, use the definition of the derivative to calculate out f prime of x, or the derivative of f of x, for f of x equals the constant function 5. So we know that the derivative function is given by f prime of x is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Okay, so the very first thing is, okay, everywhere I see an x, I'm going to plug in x plus h. Huh, right? There are no x's in this constant function. So when I go to try to plug in x plus h, well, it's just 5. Minus f of x. Well, here it is. That's just also 5 divided by h. And you can see I forgot my limit here. It's important to remember these things. The limit as h goes to 0. So this is, well, 5 minus 5 would be 0. 0 divided by any non-zero, right? So h is close to 0, but not equal to 0. So 0 divided by any non-zero is going to be 0. So using the limit definition of the derivative, we see that the derivative of 5 is just 0. And that gets us to our first rule here. So if f of x is equal to any constant c, right, any constant function, then the derivative of it is going to be equal to 0. So we saw a very specific case when it was equal to 5, but the claim is this works for any constant function. And the reason why that is is, of course, if we were to graph out you know, a constant function here, so here's my x and y axis, and I'm going to go ahead and maybe use green to show this is a constant function, you know, at whatever c value you'd like here. And remember, the derivative is talking about the slope, right? We want to know what is the slope of this constant function. And you can see it's nice in a horizontal line here that the slope is 0. No matter which x point you choose, the slope is always 0. And therefore, this makes a lot of sense, right? No matter which x value it is, it's always 0. So this is the 0 function right here. Likewise, we can do for any linear function, mx plus b, right? Any linear function, the derivative of any linear function is just equal to m. Because again, we're thinking about what does the derivative mean? It's telling you something about slope at a point. And for linear functions, no matter which point you choose, I'll use orange in this case, why not? Any point you choose, the slope's always the same. The slope is always m, right? Based on this right here. So you can see for constant and for linear functions, you can calculate these things very quickly. So let's get to it here. Quick mini example, find the derivative for f of x equals 4 minus 7x. So notice it doesn't say use the limit definition or anything like that. So I can go ahead and apply my rule here. We know that f prime of x is going to be equal to negative 7. And the reason why is because this is a linear function and the slope here, the thing that's next to x is negative 7. So therefore, the derivative function is negative 7, right? No matter where you are on this function, 4 minus 7x, the slope is always negative 7. OK. Now, a very powerful rule. <laughs> it's called the power rule. And so if you have any power function here, x to any power, right? General power function, n can be any real number then the claim is that the derivative of this thing is n times x to the n minus first power. Okay, So this is, again, a very powerful rule. Uh, it's not at all intuitive why this is the case. Um, you can go through a proof of this. Kind of the best way to do it uh, is if you have something called mathematical induction for a proof. 
Otherwise, you need to know something called the binomial theorem, or you need to know something about logarithmic differentiation. Uh, so it's a big pain to actually prove this thing, but there is a proof, it is a theorem. Uh, but we're going to take it for granted here, and we're going to use this. So let's bring it together with a mini example here. So again, it doesn't say use the limit definition, right? So we can go ahead and use this power rule. In this case, our n value is 7, right? So this is x to the seventh power, so n equals 7. So therefore, by the power rule, we know that the derivative, f prime of x, is going to be equal to n times x to the n minus first power. Or, of course, we would simplify this down, and we would write 7x to the sixth power. And that's what the derivative is equal to. I have a nice highlighter now. I'm going to highlight this answer. Why not? There we go. There's our final answer right there. Ha. Okay. So that is the first big rule. This is the power rule. Let's go ahead and continue. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the sum, difference, and constant multiple rules. Sum, difference, and constant multiple rules basically say all of your dreams come true when you have sums, differences, or constant multiples. That is, if you have f and g, and it makes sense to take the derivative of these things, aka they are differentiable, and c is some constant, we see it here in this last one here, then instead of taking the derivative of the sum, you could take the derivative of these things individually. So f of x, g of x, right? Take the derivative of each one of these, and then add the results together. So f prime of x plus g prime of x. So this, in some sense, says that you can distribute this little prime thing, right? Likewise, for subtraction, right? You can distribute this little prime thing, and you're going to get f prime of x minus g prime of x. So the derivative of f minus the derivative of g. And then finally, constant multiple rule here is say basically that you can ignore these c values. So you can just do c times f prime of x. So you can take this little prime symbol and give it right to the f, and that's all you need to do. So constants here are basically along for the ride. OK, so with these rules right here, in addition to the power rule, we're going to be able to solve quite a lot of problems. We're going to be able to take derivatives very, very quickly. So again, find the derivatives of the following function. It doesn't say use the definition of the derivative or use the limit definition of the derivative. So we can use our power rule comboed with the sum, difference, or constant multiple rule. So let's go ahead and try it out here. So if I wanted to know what f prime of x is, right, the derivative, well, you can imagine I have to take the derivative of x to the fourth and x squared. And according to the sum rule up here, we can go ahead and take the derivative of x to the fourth and then add that to the derivative of x squared. How very nice. We know what these derivatives are thanks to the power rule, right? So this is going to be 4x to the 4 minus 1 power. So 4 minus 1 is going to be 3. And x squared, the derivative of x squared, is going to be 2 times x to the 2 minus 1. That'll be first power. Uh, well, x to the first power is the same thing as if you just wrote x, right? So there's the derivative, right? Uh, maybe I'll tie it all together and write f prime of x is equal to 4x cubed plus 2x. See how easy that was? These rules are great. They're so much faster than doing the limit definition. They're just great. Let's try another one. This one, ooh, this one's a little bit more complicated. We have to remember here that when you have... 1 over t, something like this, that you can express this as t to the negative first power. This is a property of exponents. So the fact that 1 over t and t to the negative first power are the same thing is very important, right? Because now when I have t to the negative first power, I can apply the power rule to this. So that's going to be very nice. The other thing that we need to remember here is that we have square root of t. That's the same thing as t to the 1 half power. So if you've forgotten these facts from your algebra days, make a big special note of these things because this will come up a lot in this class. We will be taking derivatives of things like 1 over t and the square root of t. And we need to remember that these are t raised to some power, right? t to the negative 1 and t to the 1 half. So OK, this is my first step here. And notice I haven't taken a derivative or anything. I just went and rewrote the function. Next up, now let's go ahead and take the derivative. So if I wanted to take the derivative t to the negative first power minus t to the 1 half power, take the derivative, a little prime symbol there. Well, 
Again, thanks to the difference rule, I know that I can take the derivative of t to the negative first and subtract away the derivative of t to the 1 half, and this will give me the same result. Right? So now here I'm using the difference rule. So let's go ahead and do that. Now I need to use the power rule. So the power rule, the derivative of t to the negative first is going to be negative 1. So the n, right, n x, well, in this case, our independent variable is t, so it's going to be t, and then n minus 1, so negative 1 minus 1. I'll go ahead and break it down. Uh, oops, ah, getting ahead of myself. Negative 1 minus 1. There we go. Minus, okay, n, right, so the 1 half comes down times t, our independent variable here, raised to the 1 half minus 1. So again, this is g prime of t here. And so I'm going to have negative 1 t to the negative second power, right? Negative 1 minus 1, minus 1 half t to the 1 half minus 1. That's going to be negative 1 half. So it's fine to leave your answer like this. We actually can take a line to simplify if we'd prefer. I'm going to write one more line, kind of using our exponent facts here. And so if you wanted to simplify one more step, you can make this negative 1 over t squared, right? This fact that the negative exponent is the same thing as dividing by it, minus 1 half. And again, this negative exponent would be dividing by t to the 1 half. And t to the 1 half is, of course, the same thing as the square root. So this is a more simplified answer. Either one of these, I would give 100% to. I'm happy with either one of these. There we go. And I guess just for good measure, since I'm in the mood of highlighting things, let's go ahead and highlight this one up here. All right, one more example. I've demonstrated to you the sum rule. I've demonstrated to you the difference rule. Now let's demonstrate the constant multiple rule. So if you have some constant multiple, seven here. And if I want to take the derivative, I'm going to do this one a little bit faster here. This just says the constant multiple rule says that the c's along for the ride. So in this case, seven's along for the ride. And then I need to take the derivative of x cubed. So the derivative of x cubed is going to be 3x squared. That's thanks to the power rule again. And so finally, if I wanted to simplify maybe one more line, right? 7 times 3 is going to be 21x squared. And right there is my final All right, so that is the end of 4.1. As you can see, derivatives are now becoming very manageable. We can do these things very quickly. I'll see you guys next time, uh, I believe in 4.2. See you then. Oh, wait, I guess not 4.2, right? So if I go down here, 4.3 is next. We're skipping 4.2. This is more of an application section. We'll get to that in a lab or so. So next up, 4.3. All right, see you then.